yes, with Climate Friendly Culture, what I've been up to has been exploring the creative community's response to the climate emergency. Um, so I've been doing that through stakeholder engagement, so a combination of interviews, surveys, um, and just talking to people as well. Uh, existing data and tools. So as Anna mentioned, I have the great privilege to be working with Creative Carbon Scotland and they've been a partner in this project. So I've had access to a lot of the emissions data um, from organisations that are regularly funded by Creative Scotland over the past five years. Um, I looked at some existing tools and then there's also been a theme of collaboration. Uh, so I was very lucky to work with a developer to sketch up some concepts for the tool that we hope to make. Um, an artist, uh, Katrina Patience, where I've been, I was able to commission her to make some artwork and also map her footprint and test out a couple of ideas. Um, and with the piano drone as well, who I've been volunteering with for a couple of years and was able to bring them in on this as well. Um, so today I I'm going to tell you a bit about what I've learned and a little bit about the tool that we now have some concept sketches for. So first of all, I want to introduce you to this kind of guiding concept of climate friendly culture. So as I'm sure you're all aware, the majority of countries around the world are committed to greenhouse gas reduction in order to prevent catastrophic climate change. Scotland, we have a net zero target of 2045. But how does culture fit into all of this? And interestingly, it feeds in quite nicely, follows on from what Sean was saying about the storytelling side. So of course, uh, culture is all about thinking, imagining and feeling all together. Um, but of course, there are other ways that we can do culture as well. And so within sort of traditional carbon management, carbon efficiency would be a very big focus. Um, you'd maybe see carbon in the same way you see money, it's kind of a budget. Um, and carbon efficiency can be part of climate friendly culture, but we also need to think about influence and the kind of complex ecosystem that we're all part of within the creative community. So the way that we influence each other as practitioners, but also our audiences and participants. And then thirdly, adaptation. So how are we going to adapt to a different physical climate and how are we going to adapt to the uncertainty that we have uh, within that physical climate as well? Because that's the the sort of hidden side of adaptation, uh, our traditional risk management can go so far with adaptation, but realistically, there's a whole lot of uncertainty that comes with it as well. Um, so I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of the cultural carbon footprint um, and what I've learned from the data. I'm going to tell you a bit about what I learned from people, I'm going to tell you a couple of ideas I tested out and then finish with the tool side of things. So this data uh, comes courtesy from a Creative Carbon Scotland and as you can see it gives you five years of data. That big green section in the middle is energy and utilities. The year 2015 to 16 is at the bottom so the most recent year is the smallest year. So overall we can see there's a gradual reduction. We can see that energy and utilities generally represent the majority of the carbon footprint. This is data from 136 organisations over that time period. Um, and we can see that, yeah, it's come down. Energy and utilities is still very big, uh, but it's still there. It, it's gradually come down. Travel, not so, not so much luck there. Travel has been a sort of more stubborn and slightly more erratic within the individual carbon footprint. And then waste is a small slice on the end. And the pie chart on the right kind of gives you a further breakdown of that, showing how flights are really quite significant within that footprint as well. Um, of course, every organization is different. And with that, uh, I've worked with the data to learn a bit more about how emissions vary depending on the organization type. So the key trends being that footprint vary, varies a little between art form, but not all that much. It's far less significant than whether an organization operates premises. And actually the majority of organizations don't operate premises. Uh, performing arts footprints tend to be dominated by travel. We see a slightly higher waste footprint in visual arts, multi arts and theatre. We see a steady reduction in utilities and waste with what I'm referring to as stubborn and erratic travel emission, um, which is just part of the business. Uh, although we have to recognise that there is some influence from changes in emission factors. You may well know the electric grid is a lot more efficient than it used to be uh, due to an increase in renewable electricity. Uh, so some of that reduction will be from that. And this is a relatively small sample size, 136 just isn't very much when you're talking statistics. So we need to remember that. Uh, I carried out a survey and sent it out to 
as many people as I could reach. <laughs> and I had about 40 respondents, uh, all people working in the arts. I wanted to know what they already knew about their climate impact and what they thought they could do about it. Uh, it was interesting to note that they perceived that their main impacts would be around emissions from travel and transport, kind of reflecting a little bit of those stubborn emissions we were talking about, and that there's perceived higher influence over those travel and waste emissions rather than energy. Uh, with embedded emissions being the area where they're least likely to have influence. Uh, I also asked about what they already knew about carbon. Um, it was interesting, I asked people to put these sort of common activities, as I called them, in order of their impact, and a couple of people got it right. Uh, most people got the highest and the lowest right, um, with some confusion in the middle, um, and less than half of the survey respondents, who were people filling in the survey about climate change and the arts, had ever calculated their carbon footprint, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, but on to what I learned from people, uh, I carried out interviews with five artists, and I learned from that that generally artists, we have quite small footprints as individuals. Uh, our audiences tend to have larger footprints when they come to see us. So that was quite interesting. Um, we, I, I also learned that Again, travel and its association with success is an ongoing challenge um, that people feel the need to travel to raise their profile, to get more work, but uh, ultimately they're kind of uh, relying on this larger system and, and that's where a lot of the more troublesome emissions came from. People's artistic responses were very different depending on the art form, as you might imagine. So I spoke to a circus artist, a composer, a touring musician, um, a traditional folk singer and a video projectionist. So those were all quite contrasting approaches to nature and climate change within their work. And their main challenge really was around balancing work, life and sustainability. Um, I also interviewed Green Champions at uh, the regularly funded organisations that I talked about earlier. Um, and they talked about data collection and monitoring within the organisations where there are generally established methods for collecting that it, there's a bit of a capacity challenge around more regular monitoring and there's quite varied use of tools and um, so their approaches tended to be around minimizing and reducing emissions, changing policies, uh, trying to align with their wider work and understanding supply chains. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple of ideas I tested. Uh, this was the uh, idea of um, what influences the footprint and these were the sort of six main factors that I identified. Uh, some of which determine the harder kind of similar footprint, that's site and ownership of premises and staff numbers, whereas organisation focus and art form tend to sit on the other end of the spectrum, where they tend to be more similar opportunities that are there. Um, so that was a little bit of thinking I did. And the next bit was around mapping the footprint, so taking a more qualitative approach. And this was informed by the fact that people have a certain uncertainty around their carbon footprint, but that we still need to take action. And I used the Stephen Covey's fears of control, influence and concern to help people map their footprints, uh, which allowed for a bit of blurry boundaries and not knowing whose emissions are whose, but continues to stimulate action and collaboration. And um, so I did some of that. And then the collaboration with Katrina Patience, where we used um, words that had been used by the interviewees to describe changes, uh, and she created images around them and I was able to gift them to the artist as thank you present. Uh, then finally, just to give you a brief overview of the concept sketches that I worked on with InGenerator um, and we identified the key requirements of such a tool, <laughs> uh, were it to exist, was that it should be intuitive, enticing, convenient, prioritised, optimised and collaborative. Um, and then finally, um, the kind of key features would be around carbon calculation, setting targets, sharing concerns, recording influence and celebrating success. Uh, the main things being that within existing carbon tools, there isn't a lot of space for setting targets or sharing concerns with other users um, or recording influence out with the kind of core carbon footprint. And um, so this is kind of the, the sort of uniqueness of this um, tool would be. Um, and then our next steps are really to kind of follow up with a bit more discovery, searching out the tool concept and a bit of early user testing. So we've got some plans in the pipeline for that. And that's it.